They're lesbians and they talk lesbian talk. Mm. That's a different theme music. This is episode 64. Honey, will you still love me whenever we're at episode 64? Um, I'll have to think about that. Let me get back to you by the end of the episode. <laughs> well, today is going to be a rather amorphous episode, a nebulous one, if if you will. In um, time and space and things and stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about um, DashCon and... <laughs> uh, what a rainbow-colored pile of not working well that was, apparently. I almost wish it was near me so I could have gone. It just sounds such... It, it sounds like an expensive train wreck. It was, in, it was in Illinois somewhere near Chicago, so it makes me wonder... Well, no, I'm pretty sure if, if any of the, you know, the Tick with Tick people in Chicago went, they'd have talked about it on Twitter, but... I know uh, Holly was talking a lot about it, and she is in Illinois, so I'm, part of me is wondering if she went. No, I don't think she did. I think she would have said so. Oh... Pity. And there were other cons going on at the same time. I saw, like, pictures from Andrew Joe and stuff, so... Yeah, he was I, at... I forget what con he was at. I know that some of the Shea Apocalypse people were at uh, Kineticon this weekend. Yeah, so there's all these other cons going on at the same time. So it's like you see these pictures from cons in here and you just get these visions of, you know, everything collapsing at one con, but then Angry Joe being in the background even though it's not. It's confusing with so many cons, and apparently only one of them's a failure. All cons exist in the same temporal space. But con why did they put space? I don't know. Con conspiracy. The why would Dashcon be on at the same time as two other big ones? Well, I mean, the thing is that I guess when you schedule a con, you have to just work with what you and your people, what works for you and your people, and also what works for your venue. You know. Like, um, you're going to Brocon, actually. What weekend is that? That is the um, weekend of the 16th, 18th. It's coming up. I'm going on Friday. This My is goodness, currently Monday. that's next weekend. I was, I was plugging you right there. Ah, well, the chances are you're going to listen to this after I've gone to Brocon because Lesbian Talk takes an ice age to go up. No, it's not because we had scheduling issues and other stuff. I'm probably going to edit it today or tomorrow. But, but that's going on at the same time as Con Bravo. Mm-hmm. And, like, I've been at cam cons that took place at the same time as Gen Con. I think it's just whatever you can make work, you know, and just hope that you will get the attendance that you want, which apparently that was only one of their problems. And uh, I know that there's another con going on at the same time as Con Bravo. Um, actually, it might be Con Bravo. I know Doug is at a different con that weekend, and I don't think he's at Con Bravo, Doug being a nostalgia critic. I know this because he asked me to get in contact with the Brocon bosses for him because he was interested in going, and he couldn't because he was double booked. Well, the thing is that it's summer, it's the convention season, so pretty much every weekend there's something going on somewhere in the country. That's true. But it does mean that uh, Brocon next year, hopefully, fingers crossed, will have Doug Walker. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, like, um, I know um, Otakon is coming up, I think, in August. I'm pretty sure it's August, yeah, so that's pretty big. That's, like, one of the biggest anime conventions, so. But, yeah, so if you don't know what we're talking about, apparently a group of Tumblr fandom people decided to start a convention, and at first it was called Tumblr USA, or I'm sorry, TumbleCon USA, but then Tumblr was like, we're not affiliated with you, so they changed it to DashCon, and apparently this thing has been a clusterfuck ever since the beginning. Yeah, their games room is apparently a couple of tables a uh, and, a kitty swimming, and a kitty swimming pool filled with balls. Yeah. Well, one account that I read, which I have no reason to believe that it was a fabrication because there were a lot of screenshots involved, was someone who was on one of the committees. Because apparently what they did was they had an Indiegogo campaign last year, and that raised, I think, 4000 of the 5000 that was their goal. And then so they recruited fans to act as these fandom committees – and then made them in charge of fundraising and scheduling all their stuff. And from all of these conversations, it I mean, it's really familiar to some of the stuff that we've dealt with um, working in certain production companies where you would have, they would ask for information from the, the admins and the mods, and they were like, oh, well, we'll talk to you on Skype, but then they would miss calls or cancel at the last second. And then they would say to these committees, why haven't you raised more money? You know, if this fails, it's because of you. Well, I don't want to say. I guess for months it's been coming to a foregone conclusion that, that this would fall apart. But apparently they were at the hotel, and they said that the hotel demanded $17,000 up front, or they would kick them out of the convention, which they managed to raise. 
But then the hotel said, we never asked that. So, yeah. So yeah. where did this money go? What's, it's just it's well, such a with, cluster book. With that, I, I could have misunderstood it, but I, I took it to mean that the people from DashCon were saying that they needed $17,000, and this was a new thing that the hotel had sprung on them, and yeah. the hotel was like, we didn't, this isn't sprung, this is stuff you haven't paid yet. The way that it works usually, and this is coming from when I was in the camp, I was I helped put on a few cons, not like anything major, just like as admin staff and people's assistants and stuff like that or doing security. And what you have to do is before you actually can promote the convention, you have to have a contract with your venue that says, you know, what discounts will be offered for the rooms, what's the room block that you're guaranteed to fill, and when everything is due. And especially for first-time conventions, that money is all paid up front. That's paid before the event even happens. And especially because, I mean, I would understand if the hotel said, yeah, well, they didn't pay their bill and we got worried, so we, we demanded the money. But that's not what happened. The letter saying that it was from the hotel, that was actually, that's been photoshopped. Because I've been, I've been reading some stories about this today. Oh, wonderful. So I I'm not know. saying that's definitely what happened, but that's what it's looking like right now. I almost wish we could get um, Teddy the Minion in on the call because he, uh, years ago, he would run conventions in, in uh, you know, Northern Ireland. This convention called Tomodachi. I believe he had he did it three years in a row, and it was him and a bunch of friends. And they even managed to get international guests over. They got like uh, Tiffany Grant over. She was the voice of Asuka in the English dub of uh, Evangelion. Oh, cool! And. He eventually gave it up because he figured he was actually he was losing money every year, but it was getting better and better each year. They were making more money, but he was constantly losing like less and less. But he eventually gave it up. But I would love to hear what he has to think about things like this. Oh, I'd love to get a few people on. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you could pick Holly's brain because she's involved with with Con Bravo. A lot mm. of the people that I knew from the cam, you know, would do this. I mean, technically, when when you helped with a convention uh, for the cam. You were doing it as a volunteer, but a lot of people kind of made it a second job. You know, they put that much into it. And running a convention, even like a small game of the month or a regional convention, is not easy. It is yeah. a lot of work, and a lot of money comes out of your pocket eventually. Yeah, I I saw it firsthand with Teddy. And uh, him and the Minions, they, uh, they actually, they've recently started going back into it because they would do a video game and anime sort of thing, and they... Uh, they're doing, I think they're up to a two-day thing again. So. Oh, that's cool. Well, will, when I'm over, I'll definitely go. Oh, that would be very cool. But uh, they never had to deal with a hotel. They just dealt with the university, so I'm sure it's even worse with a hotel. Well, I mean, we you know, we go to MAGFest pretty much every year, and if you've never been to MAGFest since they moved up to National Harbor, the Gaylord is amazing. It is an amazing hotel. I mean, the first year, everybody was joking, this is, like, too swanky for us. But the hotel people are always so great about it, you know, we, we make sure that there's not a problem, that we don't get a bad reputation. And they are so nice. Like, I remember, we were, what, were, what were you we filming? We were filming, uh, if, if you're thinking about what I'm thinking about, it was God of Vampires, yeah, the intro it. part. Where, we basically, if you've seen the God of Vampires crossover that, that Hagen did with Lupa, there's a part where <laughs> Minion comes and body tackles Count Dracula from behind and takes him to the ground. And so we were filming that stunt. Uh, we had like, piles and piles of pillows, yeah, in the uh, in the hallway. And so while this is going on, um, a cleaner is being supervised on on her rounds by, I guess, her supervisor. And so the cleaner is looking at us. This guy with a clipboard and a very nice suit is looking at us, and we're like, "Don't worry, we're just filming." And he's like, "Well, you keep doing what you're doing, I guess." <laughs> and just and then that's the kind of thing is I, I can understand a hotel who's really not used to. Like, internet fandoms being like, uh, eh, I'm not so okay with this. But usually they'll be very upfront and they'll say, this convention has violated blah, blah, blah policy and things and stuff because it's their business to stay in business. And I'm more inclined to believe the hotel, actually, at this point. Yeah, to be fair, yeah. At the same time as the last MAGFest, they had like this uh, astronomy convention going at the same time. So oh, that was brilliant. Yeah, the sort of, sometimes you had big groups of people mixing into each other and I really wish that some people had cosplayed as Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan. Yeah, it would be, well, I think they were kind of like a professional convention, like people to talk about actual science going on, not to just kick back and have fun. 
Yeah, but, you know, you could totally dress as Carl Sagan and then and get away with it. I don't think I could because I don't look good in a turtleneck. Okay, well, so maybe somebody else can, can cosplay as him. But, I mean, and this thing is just all over the Internet right now. And I'm sure that you'll read articles about it, and I know that it is just pretty amazing. I just had a thought about why the Gaylord was quite so okay with having crazy people film stuff in their halls. Why is that the Gaylord is where CPAC has been for the last two years. Yes, but we were there first. Yes, I know we were there first, but it's like, they're just like, uh, we're used to Ann Coulter, like, you know, body tackling people dressed up as Obama for her own little videos and stuff. It's fine. Crazy motherfuckers. <laughs> At least you're not talking about killing Mexicans. Well, that's probably unlike, true. Unlike CPAC. And I was reading on, I, I forget, I think it was Daily Dot. It was one of, it was one website today that made the point that this is not the first convention that's fallen apart like this. I think, Around last year, there was a BronyCon that fell apart spectacularly, and the person that organized it got away with, I think, several hundred, several thousand dollars. And I don't think anything ever came of tracking her down. At least nothing that I could find through Google. I just think it's a bit strange. Uh, if you had a bunch of people on the Internet and then being brought together for a con and then someone basically steal, using it as an opportunity to steal all the money and run off, Surely they'd think that people on the Internet would be able to find them. That's what I was thinking, but I Googled this person and apparently... I found a lot of stories from last year, but then nothing recent. And also there was something called Tent Moot, which was a Lord of the Rings convention that was supposed to happen. This was back in, like, the early 2000s. And that turned into a one big, huge scam to the point where one of the people that was scammed to the tune of, like, $10,000 actually wrote a self-published book about it. I have myself on Prohibition right now. I'm not really supposed to be buying books because I'm supposed to, you know... Try to at least move without most of the books, but I may pick it up. Um, you can find it. Uh, it's a self-published book. It's on Amazon. It's called When the Fan Hits the Shit. And <laughs> now, she, she, I think that's that's pretty clever. Now she admits that this is a self-published book. Um, it's it's pretty good, but it doesn't have the benefit of a professional editor. But the reviews are pretty good for it being a self-published book. So I might check that out. So if you're interested in reading all about the dramas. Of, of a huge scam and con that failed to happen. When the fan hits the shit, I believe the author's name is Jean Rene. So check that out. I just looked on Amazon to cut it UK, and there doesn't seem to be any copies of it there. That's unfortunate. I'd love to get to see this. Well, it's a self-published book. And it's available directly from the author for um, about, looks like, uh, 13 or so dollars plus shipping and handling. So if I get it, I'm going to buy direct from the author, you know. But a complete rip-off of a Lord of the Rings convention? That just reminds me of the start of NerdQuest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, this, this kind of stuff apparently happens a lot. Okay, i got to admit, I have been to a convention which featured something not dissimilar to the ball pit, but it was part one part of a very small bit of this larger con. It was uh, BICON, and it was years and years ago, and this sort of a, for, basically it's a queer con, but it's originally started around, based around bisexuality, but you don't need to be bi to go. And one of the things they had at their sort of last night big party, which everyone dressed up as crazy people for, and me and my friend Harry dressed up as the color blue, and, uh, and that, that's where I got my blue wig, by the way. See, I knew I loved you for some reason. <laughs> and uh, one thing they had, they had a big pit, bigger than the one at DashCon, but it was filled with cuddly toy lions. A lion Ti pit? Yes, tiny ones. Thrown to the lions. Yes, and everyone got a lion. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That kind of makes it worth it. Yeah, I I would love to go back to Bicon at some point when, you, when you're over, if we can arrange it. Yeah, all right. It's just, I, I really feel bad because it seems like a lot of the people that showed up to this were minors, and that caused a whole bunch of problems because apparently IDs weren't checked for some 18 and over panels, and then, you know, stuff is blowing up, and people's parents find out, and then that's a I, whole kerfuffle, and... That actually reminds me, when I was at BroCon last year, I was doing my, my panel, like I'd never done a single panel before, so I did a section which was question and answer section where I showed an episode of the show which had been pulled from Blip, and I also showed people Chirpy f so I could get like a reaction video. Did you show it to minors? And at some point during my whole panel, not during Chirpy, but through other parts, occasionally minors would come in. Oh dear. At least I didn't see Chirpy. That's true. <laughs> but yeah so i'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this but i i feel terrible because i'm having this really great schadenfreude drama thing where i'm like oh i'll read articles about this and feel good because as i have been a victim of being scammed you know by something over the internet 
I kind of I feel bad for these people, but at the same time, I want to know like all the information. I want to know all the details. I'm just sad for the poor people who lost money, and the and I feel more sad for the people who put their own money into it, who were working on the thing and trying to make it happen, who were just thwarted by possibly yeah. malice, possibly stupidity. Well, a lot of the I, I think there might be end up being like some legal stuff going on because um, that horror podcast, Welcome to Night Vale. They actually paused their national tour to come and do this event. Um, they got there, and, and Dashcom was like, yeah, well, we can't pay you the appearance fee, and we can't pay for your flight or your room and board. So Welcome to Night Vale was like, well, we're out of here. Sorry about that. And apparently there was this one fan artist who found out when she got there, oh, by the way, you have to pay for your room. And she couldn't afford that. And so she ended up camping out with the Welcome to Night Vale people on like a folder bed. It's just like it's it's really bad. I'm, I'm sure that we will get more information as it as it goes on. But well, something I read indicated that there were other guests for not being paid for things as well. So oh yeah, it's complete and total clusterfuck. But above and beyond that, what other important thing happened in the past few days, dear? Well, um, <laughs> Doctor Who season eight seems to be in the public domain right now. <laughs> So how exactly did this happen? Because I'm a little bit confused. Okay, the BBC, in an effort to stop people from uh, heartily yarring uh, Doctor Who Season 8, they decided to, to broadcast the show on all of their channels that they have. They broadcast Doctor Who at the same time. Like they did with the um, the 50th anniversary, right? Uh, basically, yeah, but not cinema, just TV things, which includes which included having to translate it into different languages. Okay, so, fair enough. So they had sent copies of the scripts and the rough cuts of the episodes, missing some CGI, to the script in Miami via BBC America, where they could be translated into Spanish and Portuguese and stuff for Latin American markets and things like that. Okay. And at some point in this, they were held on a secure server, on a, on a, sorry, on a non-secure server, which... Either someone hacked into, but I, from based on the information I saw, someone didn't hack into it. It was easily accessible without hacking. Oh, jeez. And the files of the scripts for the first six episodes and the first six episodes themselves were all in that area. Now, the first five episode scripts have appeared on the internet, and so was the first episode. But based on what the information that was there, I would not be surprised if. The other stuff appeared later on. Wow. <laughs> Someone's going to lose their job. Possibly, or possibly a company was just really stupid and didn't realize that their servers could be entered into without hacking. They're going to lose the BBC contract. Probably. It's going to be bad for someone or more than one person. Like, seriously, you can't keep a secret about anything about this show. Yeah. Well, I suppose on one level it shows that people are really interested in it. Like... But on other episodes, okay, first episode of New Who, Rose, it was leaked weeks beforehand to the internet by a guy who worked at CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Did he and get he, fired? Yes, he did. Okay. That person was a Doctor Who fan who had got a copy of the rough cut and decided to put it online because he was a fan, and they were fired. That version uh, did not have the theme music. It had, like, the original 1960s theme music. Then... Season 7, when it went out in Blu-ray, it was sent, the Region 1 copies of the Blu-ray were sent out before Season 7 finished airing. So American fans got a copy of the season before it finished. That's great. Yeah, and which is why people were able to spoil like the name of the Doctor and stuff like that. Although, amazingly, no copies of those were ripped and put on torrent sites. That is self-control. That's true. I mean, well, I know the stuff's out. I know the scripts are out there. Um, but I'm not. I'm not going to read them, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to watch the stuff that's out. I want to watch it when it happens with the rest of the world. And that is perfectly fine. And you're like, I have already seen everything three times. I have seen absolutely everything possible. But I'm hopeful. I mean, I saw the uh, the new trailer that's out that apparently aired during the World Cup, which no one knew it was going to happen. So all of a sudden, I see Twitter be oh. like, Oh my gosh, the World Cup and the new Doctor Who trailer. This is the best day ever. Really? No one knew it? It was fairly common knowledge in the uh, the Doctor Who forum I go to occasionally. Okay, people that I know. Fair enough. <laughs> but then again, the Doctor Who fandom is pretty much like 
it's going to be a new trailer, and, you know, I bet it'll be like then. No, that's a big event. We'll go to this one. No, no, it's not there. And okay. They're just basically big event. We'll throw darts and then hope that it's there, and then occasionally they're going to be right. Well, from what I've seen of, of the trailer, I'm I'm pretty excited. I think this is going to be pretty good. You know, we may have the master skulking around the entire time. If it's Charles Dance. Uh, right. Now, based on uh, some information I picked up in forums, there's like one of the main one of the recurring characters is like this crazy woman who thinks she's the doctor's like uh, partner and she's obsessed with him or whatever, and she's called Missy. So my my thinking, and this is completely unbacked up by anything I know for fact. I think Missy is the master. A female master? master? That would be pretty interesting. I think that they're like, Ma- Missy, short for mistress. <gasps> Maybe master. she's the Ronnie. It's, it's doubtful, but in Doctor Who fandom, any time like, a woman turns up and the uh, fandom doesn't know who she is, they always assume she's the Ronnie. See, because the Ronnie's always skulking, you know? You never know what she's up to, what she's, what she's got going on over there. <laughs> the Ronnie be creeping, you. And the... Uh, I've seen the uh, clockwork robot from the trailer, which uh, is like a cyborg. Mm-hmm. Or no, is it the the robot companion back again? No, 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 no. It's seen season two of New Who. You had the uh, one with Madame de Pompadour, mm-hmm. which girl in the fireplace, where you had evil clockwork robots from the future had gone mental and started stealing because body clockwork parts. Because clockwork is always the best kind of technology to use in the future. Yep. And because they you were... want your army to have to be wound up every twelve hours. And they were, they took the crew of the ship that they were on and they basically eviscerated them and used their body parts to try and repair the ship. Like you do. And uh, the guy in the trailer who's got like half a face, Mm -hmm. he looks just like a clockwork robot who's covered himself in skin. So I'm thinking it's Stephen Moffat reusing his old ideas again. This is my prediction. Ship from the future somehow ends up in Victorian times. The clockwork robots are somehow, for some reason, trying to turn themselves into people and um, using dead people's body parts because And it's up to the doctor to sort this out. Yes. I saw on one site there was a poll, what do you think the new doctor's catchphrase is going to be? Um, I have not seen any information about a possible new catchphrase. I'm hoping he doesn't have one. But any bets, he's going to say he's going to say um, Geronimo at least once in the first episode because... Just to make all the all the David Tennant fans be like, okay, I feel better about this now. Uh, not so much. It's because David Tennant, I'm pretty sure, said fantastic at, in at least once in the first episode with, you know, with David Tennant, because mm-hmm. fantastic was Eccleston's thing. Of course, maybe Stephen Moffat will finally realize that the Doctor doesn't need a fucking catchphrase. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, so anyway, so if you if you want to go out there and look at these things, you can. There, I'm sure they're just a Google search away. Yeah, we tried to be spoiler free because you know the internet hates spoilers. But if you want to go check them out. You know, be the first person on your block to uh, to know what the doctor's all about. You say I'm the doctor. Da, 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 da. I don't even know what that was. That noise was. That was an impersonation of Peter Capaldi as the doctor. Except that sounds nothing like him in any way, shape, or form. Say, like, I'm the doctor. Da, 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 da. That sounds even worse. Oh, I'm sorry. Your Scottish accent is very pronounced, like cartoonishly so. Well, in my defense, Peter Capaldi's from Glasgow. Are they the bad ones? Well, they're not bad. It's just Glasgow is the industrial big city in Scotland. That's and where everyone's tough, right? Yeah, it's one that's it's got a reputation for being hard to understand. It's uh, harsher. Ed- it's Pittsburgh to Edinburgh's uh, Philadelphia. I can deal with that. You know, Edinburgh is all about culture and high-classness. And here we are. We are in Edinburgh. Oh, it's wonderful. And Glasgow is like us, you bastards. If you're a bastard from Glasgow, write the show. And anyone from Glasgow, if you're upset, um, my family is ancestrally from Edinburgh, so I have to sort of have that opinion. Apologies. This is true. We were, like, walking around. We were in Edinburgh, and we passed this great big tower, and I took a picture of it. And then I put on Facebook, I was like, oh... Here we are in front of the Willard Scott Memorial, and apparently that Wal- was incorrect. Wal- Walter Scott. I knew it was a W. <laughs> then I would get really upset that my father-in-law might see it, and then I'd get a lecture. You'd be like, no, this is not the Willard Scott Monument. Willard is hardly a Scottish name. It's Your dad sounds Walter. nothing like that. <laughs> You'd be like, well, you see, Walter Scott, and then I'd be like, you've, okay. You've never heard him with his uh, his more pronounced Scottish accent? I just heard him when he talks for normal. 
Well, it depends. Uh, if he's like tucking the phone, he has got a shack that increases for some reason. I'm not really sure why. For trolling. Possibly. My father-in-law is a troll. He's an internet troll, but in the real world. This yeah, is, but uh, this is not an exaggeration. This is the truth. But yeah, as a 60, 60 plus year old version of a troll who's very polite about it. Yeah. It's just like, well, I just decided to wear this uh, t-shirt because it it references something horrible that happened in this area's life history. Or no, tell them what he did on Facebook. Oh yeah, he started writing out these deepities, these sort of little sayings that sound really profound but actually aren't. And uh, he would quote them all to like this great Chinese philosopher, Qi Ting, and things like that, just to see if anyone you know liked them or not. And then he would be all like, "Aha! I was fooled, you." Trolling. Like, whenever he was in um, Edinburgh, not Edinburgh, sorry, whenever he was in Washington, D.C., he did express interest in sort of finding some sort of a T-shirt that would allow him to be proud of the fact that, you know, the War of 1812 burned down the White House. I don't think he'll be able to find a T-shirt like that. Well, not in Washington. The Canadians might sell one. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian silk screeners kicked off the National Mall for selling unpatriotic T-shirts. But he, he really wanted to wear something like that so he could, you know, wander around Washington and annoy people. This is the family that I married into. Well, you can see where I got some of my humor from. That's definitely true. First time I went to Washington, I wanted to find a replica red, red coat outfit so I could wander around in that. Well, that would have been really hot and uncomfortable, first of all. It would, but it would have been really badass to own. You're the strangest person I know. You can totally see Hagen in a red coat outfit. Yeah, that, that's true. I could. Like a general type thing. I mean, we walked through the American uh, History Museum in the Smithsonian, and I was, every single time we found these sort of like old uniforms from the history, I was sort of mentally ticking off whether I wanted it or not. Yeah, I would be taking a picture of like some really complex military thing, and she'd be like, oh, I want that. I want it so much. But so, anyway. Dun, dun, dun. My favorite transition ever. The only transition I ever use in the show is but so, anyway. It's time for One Time at the Store. If this is the first time you've ever listened to Lesbian Talk, I've been working for more or less the past decade at a large chain bookstore. I've been there, I've done that, I've seen it all, and this is one of those stories. Now, I don't talk about it a lot, but I am fully cafe trained, and I did work exclusively in cafe for a few years. So I was working this weekend, and I came in on Sunday to find out, surprise, surprise, somebody called out, so I was in cafe. So it's it's always interesting working in cafe because pe- even people who are really nice to you when you're on the book floor, they will they kind of get the mentality that if you're working with food or in food service, that you have made some horrible life decisions rather than you came in and the manager said we had someone call out in cafe, so I need you to work in cafe. So people are they can be a lot nastier to you. But so one of the things that we have is we have sandwiches and wraps, and they come pre-made. They come pre-made and frozen. We defrost them, and they they get heated up in the the oven. But what we also have is these really great rubber plastic replicas of all of our sandwiches. And they're in the case so people can look and see, oh, this sandwich looks like that. All right. So one day, this was at, this was a few stores ago. It was a kind of lazy day in cafe, not too busy. This woman comes up, and I said, oh, what can I get for you today? She's like, I'm still looking. And I was like, all right. So you go to town on that and she just gets this completely disgusted look on her face and flounces off and i was like what was that about and then i had a moment and i called after i said ma'am you do know that the sandwiches in the case they're replicas right and she turned around and, and, and said what And i said they're they're rubber they're rubber and plastic they're not real and she came back over she goes oh good because they look like they're all growing mold and i was like no it's this they're made of plastic they're not real and she said, oh, okay. Well, in that case, I want a sandwich. So at least I got a sale out of that. But then I've had other customers that have looked at me and goes, your, your sandwiches are growing things. And we're like, no, they're, they're not. They're, they're not real. I wanted to put up a sign that says, please note sandwiches in case they're not real. But the manager wasn't really about that. <laughs> but we, like, if you think that's funny, you'll like this even more. Um, in some stores that I've worked... Uh, we, because we do have bagels available, but we keep them in, um, you know, we keep them in a, in a little bin that's behind the counter in one of the drawers, you know, just to keep them fresh. So we usually will have one regular and one multigrain kind of decoy bagel. And this bagel is very old. It's probably months old. And it's just the decoy bagel that says, yes, we have bagels, and it's not ever served. 
Well, the first day working in cafe at my second store, I didn't realize that we did the decoy bagel thing because at my previous store we didn't. So a guy asked for a multigrain bagel and I was like, sure, sir. And I got out the bagel and I, you know, put the bagel on the toaster and everything was fine. And I gave it to him and he went away. And then a few hours later, the girl who was training me, who was the, in charge of the cafe, was like, um, where's the decoy bagel? And I said, the, the what now happened? And she goes, the multigrain decoy bagel. And I said, I served it to a customer. She says, oh, my God, that's been in there for two months. And I was like, well, he didn't complain. Oh, dear. So, yeah. You, you might have accidentally killed him. I don't think I killed him. I mean, it was probably, well, the thing is, it was probably more than stale, but it was toasted. So I don't know if that would, he'd just think it was toasted, really. I, I don't know. Nobody ever came and complained about it, so I guess I got away with it. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose, that's for sure. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. But I assure you, if you ever come into my cafe and you see me there, I will never, I won't give you a decoy bagel or a plastic sandwich. But anyway, what did we watch this week? We watched the um, original Eighth Doctor thingy filmed in Toronto, I believe it was. Or no, Vancouver, because everything in the 1990s made in America was filmed in Vancouver. And uh, the Paul McGann movie. So, I just gotta say, this was really bad. It was really, it was so, first of all, it was so 90s. It was so tropey. And it was so American. I am not going to disagree with any of those points. I will, however, say that on top of it being really bad, there are good elements. There are good elements, but oh my god, I was so hoping that his quote-unquote nearly companion would be killed and stay that way. It's like... Come with me. And she's like, no. And I'm like, good. You can't hack it in the TARDIS, bitch. <laughs> oh, it was great. just so, it was so bad. Like, okay, so here's what I have to, I have to find out. What was the UK's, like, what was, like, the British fans' response to, to the movie? Amusingly, well, amusingly for some people, a lot of the things that the British fans absolutely hated, a lot of those things are touched on in New Who a lot more, like the kissing. Yeah, the, that was... She's, she's like, I love you, more, more. I'm like, stop it, Doctor, stop that. Yeah, the being a Doctor Who fan at the time, it was like, Jah! I was like, the the entire country had like a annoyed shudder, which New Who decided to run with, and apparently now we've got an entire generation of of New Who fans who cannot understand Doctor Who without it. But that was seismic. The other thing that really annoyed them was the Doctor being declared to be half human because apparently aliens can't be friendly. Like. So here's the thing about that. What was there was no plot reason for that to happen. That was put in there uh, at the behest of the American studios who were co-producing. Can it can canon wise be that the Doctor was just lying? Well, it's never been. They've never okay. Various bits of media have come up with their own explanations for that bit. It has, however, all been completely discounted. It's one of these things that has been ignored in Doctor Who since, and pretty much it didn't happen. Like, maybe it was that the, oh, maybe the seventh doctor, as he, you know, because he, he was dying and everything, planted a um, planted a hypnotic suggestion in his own mind that he was half human because otherwise he, you know, he thought maybe that would help the next doctor not be killed by humans or something. There's a bunch of different, like, suggestions of how to actually not decanonize that scene. Like, my, my take on it is that, the doctor, whenever he was, you know, claiming he was half human, that was a joke. And however, he does have some human DNA. And my take on that is that because the, the regeneration was retarded, it sort of took a long time to happen. That the doctor's body had started to disintegrate and break down. The Time Lord's body, because it, a regeneration is artificial, the body had an, had the ability to send out sort of like a almost like an x-ray or something around him, and it found the closest bodies which had similar enough DNA for him to be able to fill the gaps in his DNA before the regeneration happened, therefore making the Eighth Doctor partly human. Yeah, I don't like that either. Well, it's a bit like using the frogs in Jurassic Park, but that, that's my take on how the Eighth Doctor was biologically half-human. And the Master was movie. so obnoxious. I mean, no offense to that actor, because I'm sure he's good in other things, but the Master was so obnoxious. I always dress for the occasion. No, oh, it's so bad. I'm like, oh, here's the Eye of Harmony. For some reason, only human eyes can open it. Because the doctor's like, I've never been able to open the Eye of Harmony. All I needed was an Asian teen. 
I should have the, crashed into the Teenage Ninja Turtles movie. And the Eye of Harmony, it was... Doesn't work that way. It was a black hole in the... And it was around Gallifrey in the in the Deadly Assassin and stuff. So it's like, they just took a bunch of mashed things and stuck them into the into the movie. And then the Eighth Doctor was like a cross between a very young William Hartnell's Doctor and like the Doctor trying to sum himself up. You know, the first it's, seven incarnations mixed together, you get... Like the Jelly but, Baby and almost like... By their powers combined, we I am Paul McGann. I mean, he did a good job, and I, I know that I've heard one of the one of the um, Big Finish audios with him, and I know that because Nash is always talking about it that he goes off to have incredible, nearly almost to the, the, to the time war adventures in Big Finish, or as close legally as they can come. So I don't I don't want to say that it's all Paul McGann's fault because he's got to say the lines on the script, you know, he can't just not. But it was just so bad. <laughs> It was so tropey and so 90s. Like, the second they show her at the opera about to get the page to come into the hospital, and the guy gets to know she's like, he's going to break up with her. And, like, as he's like, how dare you be a doctor and be on call and save someone's life? Now, I want to say, I have an uncle who is a cardiologist in New York City, and frequently he is a day or so late to family gatherings down here in Pennsylvania because he has to had to save someone's life. Like, literally, he was late to Christmas, I think, two years ago, because he had one more patient to see in his office, and the patient was actually so ill that he realized, wait a second, I'm going to drive you to the hospital where I have admitting privileges, and because you are not going to make it to wait for the ambulance. And then he performed surgery and saved this guy's life. And I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good reason for being late to Christmas. No one in the family has ever been like, Psh, <sighs> late to Christmas because of saving someone's life. So it's yeah. just so unrealistic, and then... As soon as I saw the, the hospital administrator, I knew that it was going to be a thing where he's going to cover this up or he's going to fire her for killing a patient. Even though I, if she is as good as they say that she is, I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't fire her. Yeah, first of all, the people who are watching, you know, they are not, they, they seem to be like, you know, rich donor, you know, rich uh, philanthropists. They're not medical professionals. They don't know what goes on on the operating table. You know, uh, the complications arise and patients die on the table. That's fine. And what the hospital would probably do was conduct an investigation. But probably that wouldn't happen because there's no family to potentially sue for malpractice. A patient died on the table while people were watching. And second of all, I mean, I know it was different back in the 90s, but that's a violation of privacy to have people watching someone's surgery like that. Just random members of the public like, hey, watch this guy's surgery. You're rich. But with um, Paul McGann, like Colin, he was one of the doctors who had very little say in how his doctor looked. I know. I, I think I think he had more say than Colin did. But Paul McGann, like, he was forced to wear a wig. He had, he had a shaved head at the time. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he... Whenever he auditioned for the part, he had longer hair because he was growing it for another part. Then he shaved his head for a different part, and he came into film, and they're like, holy crap, he's supposed to have long hair, wig. And his costume, he... Stop, he, wig time. <laughs> and then he finally got to wear a costume that he liked, which was his second costume, which uses a big finish now, which is basically a blue leather jacket and a t-shirt and jeans, which... I really don't like because A, it's not doctory, and B, he looks like he's trying to be Christopher Eccleston, and Christopher Eccleston's not doctory either, so it's like, I'm Paul again. I'm going to be two non-doctory doctors at once. Well, also the fact that, like, they're like, oh, like, no one will believe that he he's an alien, but here's the thing. In every other doctor who's come to Earth where they don't believe in aliens, he's like, I travel through time and space. The companion's like, no, really? Yeah, really. All right, that's cool. Like, I wanted to be like, look, London is nearly destroyed by aliens every Christmas, <laughs> and it doesn't seem to phase anybody. Yeah, but that was set in 1999, and the new series didn't start till 2005. I know, it's just, and the, the first thing I thought was like, oh no, things are happening, and there's a convergence of stuff, because we have to make sense of this. And the first thing I thought was, blame it on Y2K, oh wait, this was made technically before Y2K was invented. Yeah, before anyone thought of it. But the um, well, with Paul McGann's costume, it's it's his best costume is the Night of a Doctor one. Yeah, that was just really really good. It's like I had totally been fighting the Time Warp bitches. But the uh, the Daleks at the start of this are so bad sounding. Ugh. They they are not on screen and they're okay. The thing starts off with the master being executed by the by the Daleks after being put on trial because of his many crimes, 
which makes no fucking sense. But because the Daleks frequently put people on trial. They don't just exterminate the shit out of them. And then they have voices like, exterminate, exterminate. And the master, he never says anything, but he's played by this Canadian actor called Gordon Tipple, who does look like a Del- the Delgado master. Originally, there was a voiceover with the master where he explained how he was put on trial and killed, but this was all part of a plan so he could maybe, like, you know, steal the Doctor's regenerations. Because the Daleks would totally be on board for helping him out with that. Yeah, but um, cleverly, uh, Russell T. Davies decided that this was part of the Time War. He decided that everything from Genesis of the Daleks, every Dalek's involvement in the show, was part of the Time War. And his idea is that as a way for the Time Lords to try and – this was their idea of you know a peace overture – was they would grab the Master, because the Master had betrayed the Daleks during, like, Frontier in Space or something, or the Daleks felt they had. So they're like, we'll give you this guy who betrayed you once, and you can execute him. And he's like, okay, and then the, then that obviously didn't work. But that was his well, way of trying to explain this. I just, it was stupid, and I don't know. So in the beginning, he's like, I have the Master's remains, here being played by corn syrup. And CGI. Oh, it was so bad. And then he, like, slinks around in slime form for a while and possesses a body, and it's just really stupid. But the uh, the good stuff from this, the design of the TARDIS inside and out. Yeah, beautiful. it's kind of like a little museum. Yeah, it looks gorgeous. The, the TARDIS has never looked better, inside and out. Uh, Svess McCoy, it was nice to see him. Although if we didn't see Svess McCoy, I can totally see people not... To, I can totally see the McGann movie not being considered part of the canon. It well, would... that's what made it canon, wasn't it? The fact that we see the Seventh Doctor regenerate into the Eighth Doctor, right? Well, it, it meant that we could not not see it as canon. Okay. Originally, you see, they were going to make a movie which had absolutely nothing to do with the original show, and it was going to be the Doctor who was his, with his evil brother, the Master, who's president of Gallifrey, and he's looking for his father, who's called Ulysses, and his grandfather, Barusa, is a ghost in the TARDIS. And this was, until very late on, this was what they were going to make. The audition pieces were done with this script in mind. There is video footage of Paul McGann auditioning to this, to the scenes from this. Jesus. Uh, and while that would have been fucking terrible and ridiculous, um, and it would have been a full remake series. So then it would have been non-canon. Yes, it would have meant when Doctor Who came back in 2005, there would be no way to canonize Paul McGann, which would have meant the whole thing was simpler. And in many ways, I would prefer that. But with this being connected, therefore you got to kind of accept it as a massive wrinkle in the show's history before it became proper Doctor Who again with the Paul McGann audios. I, I heard a rumor ages ago, and I, I would be surprised if this came to fruition. I think we would have had conf- confirmation by now that uh, Paul McGann is going to do a crossover, like a two doctors type thing with uh, Peter Capaldi. I would like to see that. I was, yeah, I think he, I think he deserves some screen time, you know. The Paul McGann movie, I give, I fluctuate between giving it a six and a seven. And if you want to see a full review, by the way, I know Nash has done one, so check that out. That's, that's true. I was genuinely surprised to see how happy I was whenever Paul McGann came back in Night of the Doctor. Well, you know what? It was really, it was really well done, and it was really cinematic, and it was really dramatic, and I, I liked that. But here's the thing: what are we going to watch next week? Well, we've got about five weeks or six weeks until. Until Capaldi, so why don't we start watching, you know, New Who at once? Okay, which which episode should we watch? We can use this to help me with my uh, 20 Who review of some New Who episodes that aren't shit. So we can start off with Dalek. Okay. I'm and really they're sorry. all they're all streaming on Netflix too. So I am really really sorry about my mind right now. I'm getting over I'm getting over sickness and my mind is still a bit frazzled. Which means she'll agree to anything. So if you want, want a cameo from Hawken, better write her now. I have no idea when I'll be able to film it. I was supposed to film this weekend, but I was too sick. And uh, I'm going to Brocon, hopefully, on Friday. Well, I can't film anything because my camera is somewhere between the post office in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and Derry. And last but not least, it is time for his favorite part of the show, the part that we could get rid of even though we tried, Giovanni's trivia question. And Giovanni, are you with us today? Yeah, well, here I am. So, I've got some bad news. Oh, really? What what kind of bad news? Well, I've been doing some studies, and it seems that mammals aren't that smart. Well, we know that. Well, why would you say something like that on a mammal-hosted show? Well, see, the fact that for two weeks in a row, 
Nobody got the trivia question. The trivia question last week, as you recall, was, why is the grocery train Piggly Wiggly called that? And the reason is that the owner wanted a tight, wanted a name that people would say, well, why did you name it that? And he could say, just so people would ask. Which is kind of surreal and philosophical. But yeah, no one got it right. In keeping with the theme this week, I'm going to ask an easier question, and it's going to be a question about everybody's favorite doctor, Doctor Who. That's his name, right? <laughs> Theta so, Sigma. Send all your hate mail to Linkara. No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, today's trivia question is, so today's trivia question is, which doctor was training to be in the clergy? Which of the doctors was training to be in the clergy? So the first person, once you hear this, tweet at the Omega Geek and tell her your answer. No cheating now, no Google, and you will be my favorite mammal next week. You get this special shout out. But for anyway, for this week, this is Giovanni signing off. I'll see y'all cats and kittens next time. So there you go. So anyway, for this week, I have been the Omega, and who do you have what to have been this week? Someone with a brain. There's no chance of that. <laughs> see y'all next week. <laughs>